Our keynote speaker is Mr. Greg Kubowick, who many of you have worked with over the past seven, eight years. He's been a, a great partner to the Ramsey Schools. I believe um, the connection was uh, my predecessor, Rich Wiener, and a few teachers went up to Boston for a conference, and then they met um, Greg, and they brought him down to Ramsey, and since then they've kind of brought him back every year for various tech initiatives, programming. And so today we, were, we, um, we had Greg on, on the schedule. We, he came up with the idea of a keynote. Um, and not necessarily focused on technology as an end, but as technology as a means to, to the ends that we seek in education. So Greg comes to us from Massachusetts. I believe he's a Patriots fan. So. With that as the introduction, let's welcome Greg. Good morning, everyone. Um, good morning to all the teachers. Can I just get a show of hands? Like, if I've done a workshop at some point with you, can you just put your hand up? Great. So, like, a super welcoming environment. If I work with you, I'm likely going to call on you to like participate or answer questions. So you've already signed up for this. Um, like Andrew said, my name is Greg Hulwick. I work with these guys here. I'm a tech teacher. I'm a former high school history teacher. Taught in Plymouth, Massachusetts for about 10 years and then joined at Tech Teacher probably about eight or nine years ago. And I'm super fortunate to have this opportunity to speak with you this morning. And like Andrew said, this is not primarily about the use of technology. I know that we're one-to-one -one and we have, we have iPads in the district. They're here. You have Chromebooks. You have access to lots of resources. But instead, I'd like to look at some other bigger picture concepts about the idea of creativity, innovation, the kinds of skills we're looking um, or ideally seeing our students walk out of the door with. Like, how often do you think of the a Ramsey profile of a graduate that's on the wall over there? Like, on a daily basis, I think of a Ramsey profile of a graduate. Yeah. Does it come into your mind occasionally, thinking of, like, what are the core skill sets we want our students to have? So ideally, we can tie that mission that you have as a district to really bigger picture stuff, but then go from super big picture, like when you were on the beach this summer, where you read in the World Economic Forum 2022 Jobs Report. No, this is the stuff I get to do, because it's super exciting, but we want to consider this idea. So this, actually my wife sent this to me the other day, and I thought it was super fitting for what we would talk about today. The day you plant the seed is not the day you eat the fruit. So my context now is my own kids. I have a kindergartner, I have a second grader. I see the kinds of things they're working on. I have this vision of where I want them to turn into or where I want them to go. Where are the K, one, two, three teachers here? Right, so you're planting seeds super early. Where's the high school history teacher? This is what I did. Right, so you're getting them. This is like many years down the line. We're doing really early work, considering opportunities to set our kids up to be super successful, walk out of that high school history class, and maybe hit every objective on that Ramsey profile of a graduate. So keep this in mind. When I'm talking about super big things, like the kinds of jobs that will be available for kindergartners when they walk out the door. This is the World Economic Forum 2022 Jobs Report. We don't have to read the whole thing. We only have to pull a few ideas out of here. Clearly, we know things are changing. The kinds of jobs that are emerging, the kinds of jobs that are going away are changing. What's fascinating here, if we go through this, if you jump down to the middle part, proficiency and new technologies is only one part of job requirements 2022 and moving forward. So the skills equation, human skills such as creativity, originality, initiative, critical thinking, persuasion, and negotiation. Does that have anything to do with technology? Required skills in 2022. Creativity, originality. Is there any connection between the kinds of skills that the World Economic Forum is pointing to as these are super critical for our students now to be successful, have jobs, pay their bills, contribute and function in society to the use of a Chromebook? Is there a connection? There could be, there's a possibility here. If we move down farther, what's super interesting is skills that might become even more important, resiliency, flexibility, complex problem solving, emotional intelligence, leadership, and social influence. Do you think about these kinds of things? 
the kinds of jobs that kindergartners now, I think about this, what will my kindergartner now do when he walks out of the door when he's a high school senior, or even if he decides to go to college, if that's even on the table at that point? Like, what skills will he need? What skills will a second grader today need when they walk out the door? And what is the prediction for these kinds of skills? It doesn't have anything to do with technology. There is a connection here. But I think it's super critical to focus on the skills required, not necessarily the technology that's in place now. If a second grader has a Chromebook now, will they have a Chromebook when they're in 12th grade? Will that be the dominant technology? Who thinks yes? In 10 years, will kids have Chromebooks in this district? Probably not. So that has to become secondary. These are the kind of goals and objectives outlined by a Ramsey profile of graduate. They very strongly connect to what the World Economic Forum is predicting in terms of the most relevant skill sets moving forward. What I think is interesting is consider empathy and creativity. How often can we emphasize empathy as a core skill set in a high school math class? Can we emphasize empathy as a core skill set in a middle school science course? Who does consider that often in their project design, their lesson design, their unit design? Empathy as a core skill set. If you do, like really raise your hand. I consider this, right? It's more than that initial question. Like a ton of you consider this. Why do you think that is in your profile of graduate? Why do you think it's even reiterated in all predictions in terms of core skill sets? Why is empathy becoming so critical? Is it a new skill set? for students to embrace empathy as a component of who they are. Your hand shot up right away. What are you thinking? Can we agree with this? We live in a global world. We must understand other cultures, other people. What about the tie to technology and empathy? What's the tie there? Because if technology is a dominant force, all of you have a phone in your pocket, correct? All of you have gone online today already, probably interacted with people online, or reviewed information online, or done something connected to the web via technology. Why is, because that's not a new skill, right? That's not a new framework, but why is it more important now? A loss of interpersonal skills due to technology. Could you argue that our students are connecting with other students or other people even more now than they were? What happened when you were in third grade and you went outside to play and your friend was in trouble and they couldn't come outside to play? You didn't play with them. <laughs> now, if you're in third grade and you go outside to play and your friend isn't outside playing, what can you still do with them? You can still connect to them. But there's another thing going on here and it has to do with the type of jobs that are available now and the type of jobs that are going away. What is technology doing to jobs? Is it eliminating them? Is it changing them? Yes. So it's fascinating to consider why empathy is emerging as a core skill set. If there's a number of jobs that are becoming automated, they're being lost due to technology, what is the one thing that humans can do now that machines can't do, hopefully, ever? Yeah, empathize with someone else. Be creative. Consider the experience of someone else. Design something for another person. Connect to another person in a way that technology can't do. Is it scary to consider the fact that machines can write a pop song? Machines can write articles for the Associated Press? You've read an article written by a machine and you didn't know it was written by a machine. But you can connect to a human in a way that a machine can't connect to a human. That's why this is becoming so critical. It's fantastic that it's in that Ramsey profile of a graduate, but we have to consider the role that this is going to play. If you've ever done a workshop with me, you've probably seen this before. Does this look familiar to anyone in the room? So I'll give you a second to examine this. This comes from the New Divisions of Labor by Levy and Renee. It also comes from a text that will give you access to all of this content. It's called Dancing with Robots. It's a really helpful white paper to consider the future of work and the role our students are going to have in that future of work. When we look at this graph, and I know it might be tough to see on the bottom there, the yellow, the orange, and the green lines. Can you see those categories in the bottom left if you have like superhuman vision? It's routine manual work and routine cognitive work. What is routine manual work? Yes, yeah, same physical action over and over again. We can all agree that this is going away, correct? 
What about routine cognitive work? What is routine cognitive work? It's if-then statements. Yeah, it's computation. So if this is the case, then we can do this, and that's completed, and we can move on from that. So it's super fascinating to consider. My colleague at EdTech Feature, and I'll reference some other work he's done in here, Justin Wright, he's the director of the Teaching Systems Lab at MIT, and he does a lot of work with the portrait of a graduate and future graduate profiles. Uh, Justin has this great exercise on the districts go through. He'll ask them to pile up all of the work that's been assigned, paperwork, work through Google Classroom, every assignment across an entire district in one day, and consider that work. What percentage of the work that is assigned is routine cognitive work? Work that is if-then statements. What would you say in this district? The percentage of work done across the entire district in one day, what percentage of that work is routine cognitive work? Throw out numbers for me. What percentage of work across the board? If we were to collect every single assignment and pile it up and categorize it, routine and cognitive, 80%. 75%. What about your classroom? Because you can't speak to the other 99% of the classroom. What do you think? 25% of the work is routine and cognitive. Would anyone go higher than that? Is there anything wrong with routine and cognitive work? Now, there's a lot of research coming about the, about the need for routine cognitive work, but it's super interesting to consider this. Notice the two jobs or the two categoriz categorization of jobs that are growing and emerging, working with new information or solving unstructured problems. Ask yourself the same question, but throw in those variables. What percentage of the work in your classroom is students working with new information, solving unstructured problems that don't have a right answer? Am I worried that every assignment that my second grader brings home is a very structured problem with one correct answer? Is that a problem? Is it a problem? No, what are we trying to do in that scenario? Like build up capacity, have this core skill set, have a background of knowledge, we're able to do more complex work, but we, do we have to pull the opportunity for more complex, meaningful work off of the table because students are seven or eight years old? Or ask yourself this question, what percentage of the work that I am giving my students is working with new information or dealing with unstructured problems? Why is that job market emerging? And why is it important for us to consider the kind of work we're giving our kids that aligns with that categorization of work? Why do we have to consider this? Say that again. Why? Yeah, it's a changing world. The technology is taking jobs. Have you heard this idea that, um, I can't remember the state, I apologize for like the really vague description right now, uh, Northwestern state where something like 70% of all males in the workforce drive trucks. What's going to happen to 70% of the male workforce in this northern west state in the next 10 years? Will truck drivers have jobs in the next 10 years? No, this is automated work. This is if-then statements. Machines can already do that work. Do you wake up in the morning designing your lessons, thinking about jobs, truck drivers, automation, cognitive tasks, if-then statements? No, of course not. But it's super important to keep in mind. Now, this is also really fascinating. On the left, future work, stable roles. I know you can't read everything over there. New roles emerging in the middle, moving forward in the job market. Innovation professionals. What does an innovation professional do? Good question. Keep going down. People and culture specialists. What does a people and culture specialist do? What's the one skill that humans have that machines don't have? To empathize with one other person. It seems like it's the case that if-then statement jobs are disappearing. Jobs where you have to connect with someone, communicate with someone, identify a problem, work with a new scenario, solve that problem, present a potential solution is emerging. I think it's comical that on the redundant roles on the bottom right hand corner, lawyers are going to have redundant roles moving forward. Why is that the case? And I know this is completely separated from your kindergarten classroom. 
why would a lawyer be a redundant role moving forward because of technology? What is most of the work that they do? Yeah, it's research, it's processing information, identifying commonalities across multiple documents and multiple, multiple scenarios over time. Who can do that work faster than a lawyer? A machine can. From my colleague Justin, unstructured problems are those where the desired endpoints are unknowable in advance, or the set of information needed to solve the problem is unknowable in advance. Broadly speaking, we think of these problems as requiring creativity to solve. How many of you, by a show of hands, ask your students to be creative, or give them the opportunity to be creative in your classroom? And I used to ask my students to do, I remember early on in my teaching career, we'd get to the end of the unit, and I'd say, okay, we've covered everything. You can do anything you want right now to show what you understand. Create any sort of project that you want, just be creative. Have we done this before? Like pleading for creativity. As soon as I asked my students or gave them the opportunity or the protocol of just be creative, what was the first thing that happened? It was the complete opposite of creativity. It was low-hanging fruit. We all have access to Google Slides. I will make a presentation in Google Slides and call it creativity because you didn't tell me what to do. I chose this platform, but it was the easiest entry point. They weren't really solving a problem. They weren't being creative. They were using technology in a way to complete the task. So how often do we truly ask our students to be creative and what does it mean to be creative? Can you do this for a moment? Turn to the person sitting next to you, your friend or colleague or the person behind you. I want you to try to define what it means to be creative. Do that for a few moments and I'm going to see what you come up with. Come on. You're having really good conversations, I can tell. One person from this side of the room. What is super loud, raise your hand. If you've already raised your hand, you're off the hook. What does it mean to be creative? What do you come up with? You're all talking really loudly. <laughs> Maybe someone in the front row. <laughs> the process of coming up with original ideas that have value. So original ideas that have value. Value for who? For the person who came up with them or for the community that's going to receive them? Like value for me as the creator or value for someone else in the community? Or could it be both? It could be both, great. Another, yeah, what do you have? Really loud. Oh, you want to come up here and do the rest of the game? <laughs> that was fantastic. So thinking outside of the box, maybe not putting students in such strict design constraints and give them opportunities to do this. The way I like to think about creativity and when we've asked our students to be creative and defining creativity is like big C versus small C creativity. Big C creativity, Da Vinci and Michelangelo, none of those people are in the room right now. So defining it that way is a problem. Small c creativity, meaning, I think it aligns with what you were saying here, thinking of something today in a different way, in a way that I didn't think about it yesterday. That's creativity. It's coming up with a new perspective on something, a new solution, a new idea for something that I never considered before. Do you consider yourself to be creative? Hand up. Do you consider yourself to be creative? When was the last time you felt that you were creative? I was creative today. I was creative in the past week. I'm creative with my lesson and unit and project design. It's interesting to think about this stuff. This was the last time I felt exceptionally creative. I was looking at a pair of shoes online because I've never owned a pair of Jordans and I desperately someday will own lots of pair of Jordans. And I thought, I'm going to look at these shoes differently and start to remix them. So on my phone, I was sitting in a coffee shop and I started to make remixes of different sneakers. So if you know what these are, who knows what that is, right? So like cutting up all these shoes and mixing them together, like I felt really creative as I was doing this because I'm looking at the shoe in a different way that I never did before. That could be an abomination. <laughs> if you're... I appreciate the compliment. We can talk later. So another remix of one of the most iconic shoes of all time. I'm just doing this on my phone, but I think it's interesting if you play out the story. I'm cutting these images up on my phone. I'm finalizing the picture, I'm posting it on a social media platform, connecting to other people, and sharing my new way of looking at something with other people's way of looking at something, and sharing value or solving a problem for something else, for someone else. 
And it ties to this idea from Matt McCown's the innovation book. If there are no new ideas, there is no innovation. If there is no creativity, there are no new ideas. The idea of innovation, the concept, the demand for innovation gets thrown around. I read a really awesome quote last night, and I can't remember the originator of the quote, and it was described as, are we like playing the game of innovation theater in schools? And calling for innovation, but not allowing students to do innovative work. We're saying that we want innovation. We're saying that we want creative problem solvers. We're saying that we want lots of things, but are we actually asking kids to do it? And how do we get there? We give them the opportunity to generate new ideas. Those new ideas could lead to change and innovation, but it all starts with the opportunity for creativity. But how do we get there? How do you allow students to be exceptionally creative, to identify new opportunities, to solve problems that don't have a right answer, that require them to consider new information? We will get there. Before we get there, I posed the idea earlier of routine cognitive work and the demand for routine cognitive work. Should students understand their times tables and is that routine cognitive work? Yes, they should do that, that's a core skill. So really interesting research coming out of Stanford of the connection between a student's vision for their purpose in life and their willingness to work through work in school that they don't understand the exact value for, but they know they want to have an impact down the road. So the connection could be, can we design opportunities for kids that have tre tremendous meaning now connected to the curriculum and have them develop that vision for, I can create change, I can do important work, I can be creative, I can create an innovative vision for something moving forward. This is what I see all the time though, because we have to pair this idea with creativity with the technology you have in your schools. What is unfortunately going to happen here? And what's the connection to Ramsey Public Schools and all of the Chromebooks and technology that you have? Like, what will happen to that books? What will happen to that carriage? It's going to be destroyed. This is often what you see going on in schools with regards to technology, creativity, innovation. Imagine an early 19th century engineer concerned with the improvement of cross-continental transportation. Someone comes in with a design for a jet engine. Great, the engineer says. We'll attach this to stagecoaches to assist the horses. When they try, they soon see that there's a danger that the engine would shake the vehicle to pieces. So they make sure that the power of the engine is kept down to a level at which it would not do any harm. It's not on record on whether it did any good. Could this be an analogy for technology in schools? Do you ever feel this way? We have this ridiculously powerful tool. What is the design constraint here? In this analogy, it's the horse and the carriage. Your design constraint are the standardized tests, the bell schedule, the number of students that you have, your comfort level with the technology, their comfort level with the technology, the basic skill set that they're working at. There's lots of design constraints, so this is what we often end up with. We have the tool that's pared down to the point where it doesn't create too many problems so we can keep moving forward. It's really hard to work in this environment. It requires change. It requires thinking of the work that the kids are doing in a way that we have to consider it. It requires us to embrace small c creativity. Look at the opportunity we have within the design constraint of our curriculum, within the design constraint of expectations that you have, and still see if there's an opportunity to design something. And I'll show you a few examples of this. Now this is really critical to consider before we start looking at some examples of student work and what this work could look like, is the idea that, do I throw everything out? Because I've heard this proposed before and I'm not a fan of it. Do we take a sledgehammer to our curriculum, destroy everything we have, every lesson, every project, every unit, and say, like, I have to change everything, or can you identify one or two opportunities, small incremental changes, to start to, this, to embrace the idea of super meaningful work that kids are engaging with, and maybe shifting not entirely away from that cognitive type of task to more creative tasks. And this is the way I like to look at all of this stuff. How many of you grew a garden or grew some sort of vegetable this summer? A handful of people. Can you make your garden grow? Can you plead with the tomatoes to come out of the ground? Can you plead with the garden? You can't. What can you do? Because you can't make your garden grow. What can you do? You can nurture it, you can set it up, you can design the best opportunity or the best circumstances. And I like to think about that analogy the same way we have the opportunity with students in a classroom. 
Can you make a student be creative? Can you make a student be innovative? Can you make that happen? Can you force a student to be creative? No, but the idea that you both talked about of maybe we're putting them inside of a constraint, what can we do? You can't make them be creative, but what can we do? Yeah, we can change the conditions to allow for creativity or at least give them the opportunity for creativity, which is what we're looking for. And what I think the connection to technology is, and then we're going to look at a few examples, is that the technology we have, we were just chatting about this, the idea of going live, broadcasting from the data school and what technology affords, is there are almost zero barriers to students being able to express themselves, connect, be creative with the technology we have. We often create barriers for them, but they practically don't exist anymore. I mean, I was working at school last week, and there are third graders that can broadcast globally a podcast from their classroom with one device. To do that 10 years ago would have been jumping through multiple hoops with lots of technology and every possible barrier you could imagine. So the challenge is this, not can we force them to be creative, can we design opportunities that allow them to be creative, can we recognize the potential in the technology that's going to allow them to get there and express their understanding in some unique way. Like we were just chatting about this idea of empathy during the break when you were talking about creativity. If it's the case that machines are going to, technology is going to diminish the number of jobs that are available now to students, what's the one thing that humans can do that machines can't do? Be connected to another human. What does the technology potentially allow them to do? Connect with more humans, share their idea at a scale they couldn't before, be creative at a scale that they couldn't before, but are we giving kids an opportunity? And let's look at it. This is one of the most fascinating examples that I've seen. Our companies need a way to elevate humanity because people, animals, and the earth need our help. That was a design challenge presented to second graders at a school in California. Is there math in that design challenge? Is there potential for math in that design challenge? Is there reading in that design challenge? Is there collaboration in that design challenge? Is there communication? Is there creativity? It's all there. Is there science in that design challenge? Yes. So the walking around the room and watching second graders work on this design challenge, they have to design companies from scratch. Their companies have to be profitable. The purpose of their companies are to elevate humanity and help the earth. And I'm walking around the room and a group of little second graders say, hey mister, do you want to come see what we're working on? Sure, like I'd love to. And the fact that they had the confidence to like call the strange six foot six man over to look at their work was also interesting. And they designed a company called Eloprints. Eloprints, second graders, Eloprints. Their company, and they had to elevate humanity. And they went through lots of iterations on their company. Now, if the company is called Eloprints, obviously, what are they researching? Elephants around the world. They have to learn about the condition and the experience of elephants. And also, to tie it to what we were speaking about earlier, is there a right answer to this design challenge? There is no right answer. There might be better answers than others, but there is no right answer here. So they designed a company called Elephants. They're researching elephants. They're taking a reclaimed wooden doors that are going to be thrown out, they're cutting them down, they're painting them with the Prince of Ele Elephant skin, putting their research on the back of them about elephants that need help, what part of the world, what's going on with those elephants, and they are selling them. Watching second graders work through the math of what do our raw materials cost, what can we sell them for, what's the profit that we can make at different price points, they're calculating all of this, and what are they going to do with the money? Donated to an organization that needs help. They're elevating humanity by using reclaimed wood. They're doing research on the, uh, the science field that they had to research. They're creating a company. They're coming up with a solution to a meaningful problem that has no right answer. And we're creating the conditions for creativity. But this is also important to consider. What are the constraints that you have? What are the constraints that you're under every day to not do things like this? Or by a show of hands, where are the second grade teachers? In first and third can count as well for this. I think this would be reasonable. Would you be happy if your kids were engaged in that sort of design challenge in your classroom? Would you want second or third graders or first graders to do that kind of work? 
So what are the design constraints that keep us from doing that kind of work? What do you think? So we can't engage with that unless we have certain foundational skills of knowing how to multiply numbers to figure out profit margin. Or can we look at it the other way? Could we use this as the opportunity to work on those foundational skills and it becomes super important because it's, it's happening in context, not learn how to multiply here as an isolated skill, learn how to multiply because you have to figure out, can you make a profit on that product if you use this material and this much paint and this much of a plaque on the other side of it and can we turn a profit off of it? It's possible. So I mentioned the word designing or design constraints. So take a look at this framework for designing challenges for students. How might we blank or blank by redesigning blank with blank because? So if you were tasked with redesigning a lesson, redesigning a project, redesigning a unit, this could be a helpful place to start, not to come to the end result, but to start to consider what can I design? Why am I designing it? Who is the design for? What are my material constraints or my design constraints under with what materials? And then the bottom line, it comes down to what do you believe in, what do you value, and why should you bother redesigning it? So what if we looked at something like this? Collaboration comes from the Ramsey Profile of Graduate. How might we embrace collaboration for our students by redesigning? You pick the lesson, the unit, the project, the content area with whatever design constraints you have, materials, technology, resources, whatever it is, because, and this is what comes down to what you believe in as an educator. What you believe in, how does it connect with your portrait of a graduate? And my goal was to get to chapter 20 by May. That's what I believed in, get to chapter 20 by May. As I progressed in my teaching career, and what I believed in changed drastically, and my goals became, how can I create a scenario for my students to be creative and collaborate? How can I create an opportunity for my students to share their voice and demonstrate their understanding in unique ways that they haven't been given the opportunity to before? So using these how might we statements and considering what do we value, what do we, what do we want our students to walk out of the door with? How might we embrace empathy amongst our students by redesigning a unit, a project, an activity with Chromebooks and Google, if that's the design constraint you have, because we value meaningful work amongst our students and we want them to find value in others, if that's what you believe in. This framework could be a starting point for creating the opportunity, not confining students, but creating an opportunity for creativity, designing an opportunity for innovation. Is this possible and how often do you get the opportunity to do this? Do you consider this in your thinking? Can we make school feel like or can we blur the lines between the work kids are doing in school and the work that they're going to be doing in the real world? The challenge presented before, our companies need to elevate humanity. Is that blurring the lines between school and real world? Right, second graders are starting companies for the purpose of elevating humanity. This is a really monumental task to try to blur the lines between the routine cognitive work that we may be engaging in, which has value in itself, and the kind of work they might be required to do based on the predictions of the World Economic Forum's 2022 job report of the kinds of skills that are going to be required. Can we create opportunities for the work to be exceptionally meaningful? Here's another example of that. What's going on here? Is this meaningful work? Is this blurring the lines between school and real world? Can you get a sense of what that is? It's a whale made out of chicken wire that's hanging in the foyer of the school. What do you think the work is, or what was the challenge, or what was the task that the teacher presented to the students? Was it a recycling unit? Was it a math unit? Or was it a unit about whales? All of it together. How might we bring awareness to our school community of the problem of pollution or of single-use plastics by designing a, come up with it. Like, what can we design to bring awareness to this problem? So
So this group of students decide that the way that they can best bring awareness to this problem is by doing that. Guess where the single-use plastic came from that they collected to fill up that well? Their school in one day. They walked around and collected trash and filled up their well that they hung. Guess what else they did? Because there is math going on embedded in this experience. They calculated the trash being thrown out versus the plastic being thrown out versus the plastic that could be recycled. So making their own little Google Forms to tally numbers in one totals and figure out what was happening. The research that's going on to understand the condition of the whales, all of the background work, the reading that they engaged with, the collaborative nature of this, the creativity and the opportunity to design that. Would you be happy if students designed a whale full of trash and hung it in the foyer of the data school? If that was their solution to how might we bring awareness to this scenario or this problem. What's also interesting is if you play out the story, they actually create a change in policy in their school. You are not allowed to use single-use plastic in their school anymore. What you engage with in the cafeteria was changed because of this whale. Does that fulfill the task of bring awareness to? If you walk into the building and you walk under that well every day, it's going to bring awareness to this situation. There was research connected to this. There was a poster connected to this. There was a pie chart that the students created. There was a write-up connected to this. It's all there. They can explain with clear intention why they designed that well. So this is the challenge. Can we do something like this? Can we create opportunities for our students to, to do exceptionally creative work? within the design constraints we have, with taking advantage of technology, with the awareness that the kind of skills they need to have moving forward are changing. This could be a good starting point to get there. How many of you would honestly, and I know I went through this quickly, and I've done that as a six hour workshop. How many of you would consider that as a framework to start to rethink the kinds of challenges you're presenting to students? Be totally honest. How many of you would consider that kind of framework? as a way to start to think about redesigning challenges or opportunities for students. There's other examples that I want to present in here. We're a little bit short on time. I'm going to give you all of these resources, but I want to also give you a few things moving forward. If you're going to start to do this work, you might have to have more places to go than simple how might we statements. If you've ever come across the work of Scott McCloud, he has a fantastic resource called the Four Shifts Protocol. And Scott's protocol is this. He identified four strands of ways of thinking about having students do more meaningful work in schools. As opposed to saying, do this, then do this, then do this. The resources linked in the slides that I'm giving you are really informative and open questions to consider. If we want students to do higher level work, engage with critical thinking, engage with new information, solve unstructured problems. Scott presents about 10 open-ended questions that are yes or no. You can examine the work you're doing and say, does it subscribe to this or does it not? If it doesn't, then we need to consider it. So I would really encourage you, if the how might we statement is not one that's going to help you move forward, to go to the resources I'm providing and examine Scott's four shifts pro protocol. The other thing that you might want to do, because there's a wealth of resources in here, my colleague Justin designed a course called Envisioning the Graduate of the Future for the edX platform. The course is closed, but it's archived, and you can go in and examine every single resource they have exam available, examples of schools around the country that are re-envisioning what it looks like to graduate from their school district, and the kinds of changes they're making from K to 12 to re-envision that change, or embrace the profile that they've already laid out. Like the profile is there, but can we create opportunities for students starting at K all the way up to 12 to fulfill that profile of graduate to set them up for success moving forward? So, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it.